I'm the host, Tony Clement, and uh, we are doing this uh, not quite uh, uh, live. We're doing this virtual uh, in our home offices, but uh, that's how we roll here at the News Forum. So uh, the show must go on. And of course, uh, we're in a very uh, challenging time with uh, COVID-19 and a challenging time economically as well. And all of those things are crowding the minds of Canadians from coast to coast, as well as our decision makers. I'm very pleased to have on our program today, uh, Mr. Bill Robson, who is the president and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute, a great think tank uh, based in Toronto, but has national reach and, uh, and certainly has a lot of uh, commentary on the current COVID-19 situation. So, Bill, thank you for being on the program today. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I wish you and uh, everybody watching well as we get through this difficult time, and we'll see what we can do to illuminate the economic situation and uh, some of the policy responses. Indeed, we will. Let's get to, to uh, what your, uh, your state of things right now is. How do you view the COVID-19 situation from a C.D. Howe Institute point of view on uh, the, uh, the health side, but also on the economic side. So much of what you uh, anticipate on the economic side is contingent on what happens on the health front. And uh, we're following the news, uh, looking at the data. We're not health experts or epidemiologists, but trying to make sense of it as, as so many other people are. Uh, at the moment, I think that it's fair to say uh, we know and we're now seeing it in the jobless claims and, and we're going to see some very uh, unhappy labor market statistics quite shortly uh, that we're headed into a deep recession. Uh, the question is, is it going to be a valley that we come out of uh, such that we're not necessarily where we uh, were going in by the end of the year, but but certainly up on a, on a steep upward slope? Or is it going to be longer and more protracted? Uh, given the unknowns, uh, it's very hard to be definitive. I'm optimistic that we will find, and certainly you see this in some of the countries that were more on the front line of dealing with this virus, uh, that we are going to be thinking about restarting the economy uh, in, in many sectors anyway, uh, not all, but many uh, in a few weeks' time, and that as we get to the end of the year, we are going to be uh, well on our way out of this. I hope that that's true. Uh, what that implies for businesses is... Uh, Pretty dire if you're a, a low margin operation uh, with with uh, a heavy exposure to consumers, hospitality, and so on. I, I wish I could say more to offer comfort there, uh, but it's a very difficult situation. Uh, for a lot of other businesses, I think the challenge is to uh, try and see ahead to what a resumption of something approaching normal life looks like. And as we think about the policy measures that we're going to be discussing in a bit of detail, uh, I think for policymakers, it's especially helpful uh, to the extent they can to give a sense of what the time frame is on this, uh, because uh, among other things, that's going to influence the way consumers, households, uh, businesses think about the future and how they behave. You know, that's very interesting, uh, and we will get to the policymakers in a second, but uh, it's such a moving target right now. Uh, as of last week, uh, most people were thinking about the end of March. Then we had President Trump talking about the end of April. Now we've had John Tory, the mayor of Toronto, talking about three months' time. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, uh, obviously business does not like uncertainty, but uh, the yardsticks keep moving on us, don't they? Well, they do. And, and I, I understand why that's the case. And I certainly understand why the public health measures and, and the public health experts are calling the shots right now. Uh, so no objection to that. Uh, it's a bit much also, uh, I know some people are frustrated if they hear the federal government and provincial governments and municipal governments saying different things. Uh, we can't expect them all to sing from exactly the same book because nobody knows for sure. But I do uh, I do wish that some of the policymakers that are saying things like, you know, going to get worse before it gets better, uh, could be months. I mean, they don't know that either. And I think right. to uh, for, for, for the business that's thinking about, I mean, it, it's not just psychology. We all have to make our own judgments. But uh, if you're if you're very dependent on what the, uh, the municipality you're in does, and, and you've got some uh, people that you're really trying very hard to hold on to. You don't want to lay people off. I mean, 
it's it's not a statistic. Everybody who's an employer uh, out there or somebody who's thinking about this maybe happening to them knows psychologically the trauma is tremendous. If you're able to hold on to people through something like this, uh, that's very valuable for both sides. So anyway, people want to hold on to their employees if they can. They want to make the payments if they can. They want to keep, uh, uh, you know, doing the things that they know they really should do. So it's not helpful to have, say, a municipal official talk in terms of months and months without end because that's not a, a valley that you can build a bridge across. It, it, too many people might just give up. So I, I appreciate there are limits to what people can do, but I think that the really doom and gloom pronouncements and the sort of, you know, the new normal is this disaster, uh, that's not helpful. Well, and, you know, uh, at the end of the day, we do need a functioning economy. Uh, <laughs> you know, all of this home office stuff is good as far as it goes, but we need to move product. We need to manufacture things. We need to... Uh, to create wealth if we're going to sustain even a healthcare system. Is that not correct? Well, yeah, you've just made two uh, really salient points. One of them is that we've got uh, key parts of the economy that at the moment are functioning, uh, sometimes uh, sort of stuttering with, with, with problems in supply chains and so on. But if you think of what's happening with trucking, you think of what's happening with a lot of the movements of goods and services, it's, it's still there. And I think that governments, as they're thinking about the maximum lockdown measures and so on, need to be also thinking very hard about that because, you know, the initial hoarding of toilet paper and frozen pizza and so on sort of said more about the mentality of the, the people who went on that kind of shopping binge uh, early on than it did about what really matters and, and what where there were potentially serious shortages. But if we were to actually see breakdowns in those supply chains, things would get uh, far worse. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's helpful, even as we deal with the public health measures for governments to be talking positively and thinking constructively about the the infrastructure of the economy and the supply chains. Uh, the other really salient point that you made, though, uh, this is a sobering one, and I, it, it, it bears uh, repeating. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing right now is focused on sustaining demand, which is appropriate and necessary. Uh, but this is a supply side hit to the economy. There are fewer goods and services being produced. There are people who would like to work who can't. There are things being held up at the border that we would like to uh, uh, see go through. And, and what that means is that it's not just a matter of propping up demand. There is a hit to the amount of goods, goods and services that we can actually enjoy. And one of the things that we have to start paying more attention to as we get past this initial crisis response is uh, there are going to be shortfalls relative to what people are expecting. There is a burden that we need to share here. Uh, there are people who are naturally concerned about uh, lower income people, people who have various challenges in their lives. There's a brewing issue of the public sector versus the private sector because the public sector so far really hasn't felt uh, the pain of this. And so there are, with a real shortfall out there uh, in terms of what the economy can produce, uh, it's it's uh, it's pain that really we really do need to share as best we can, uh, but it's there. It's not going to go away no matter how much, you know, fiscal bridging, no matter how much uh, support from central banks we get. Uh, that's a that's a reality that we can't escape. And the longer the shutdown goes on, of course, the worse that is. So it's another reason to be thinking to the extent we can about how we manage the immediate crisis and the lockdown and then start to work our way out of this. Uh, I promise we'll get to the government response, but I do want to uh, tag on to what you just said, because I don't think people realize that um, that uh, this is a point I, I'm making and I'd love to get your feedback on it. The economic damage over time could also be an exponential curve. That, uh, you know, the damage on week one is X, the damage on week two is two X, but the damage on week three might be five X. Uh, and that's what people have to keep in mind as well, that the, the fabric of our society economically, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's not, it's not gonna be incremental damage, it could be exponential damage. Well, yes. Uh, one of the examples, I guess, to uh, sort of illustrate the point you've made is we do know that lots of small businesses and already, unfortunately, it's it's uh, uh, taking a toll in terms of permanent closures, uh, restaurants, uh, you know, live entertainment venues, uh, hotels and so on. Uh, they can survive only a very short period of time. And as they start to 
uh, fail to make payments or or close, cease their operations, uh, that ricochets through the economy. Suddenly their suppliers aren't getting paid. Uh, the employees that they lay off whose incomes drop uh, have other obligations that they can't make. So yes, it does. It does snowball over time. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that 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 sort of cumulative effect matters in another way as well. I mean, just to uh, put some round numbers on it, uh, there are about 400,000 young people who every year uh, get to the age where they're going to be having their first encounters uh, with the labor force. And the difference in their lives, not just initially, but as time goes by, if the first year that they're out there in the labor force is one where uh, the unemployment rate for that age group might be about 10% in the normal run of things, suppose it's 30%. Uh, Twenty percent of those kids who otherwise might have found work don't find work in that first year. Uh, those types of things make a big difference, not just for the period you're unemployed, but later on as well. So the economic cost of this is quite serious and it has health implications as well. Uh, we have to balance these things. I'm not arguing for neglecting the public health side of it right now. Uh, but your point about the period of time that this uh, lasts being material to how deep the impact is, uh, it applies on that front as well. Okay, we're finally at the stage where we can unpack the government response to date. I know C.D. Howe Institute uh, has done a lot of work, a lot of continuing work, uh, and it's been a rolling uh, item too. The, the initial response, the second response, we're now going into the third uh, round of response. I'd love to get a C.D. Howe's take and your take on the government response to date. I, I'd say that on the economic front, the response to date has been pretty good. Uh, it, this is a very hard situation. It is unprecedented. Uh, the amounts of money that are involved are so big that it's very natural that uh, officials at the say the federal Department of Finance or or, or uh, in the government of Ontario, other provinces are uh, uh, pretty frightened at the at the types of numbers they're looking at, and and they hesitate to commit to anything that's going to be that expensive for a very long period of time. That's understandable. Um, what we've seen so far, uh, first of all, owed a little bit to the 2008-2009 uh, crisis when uh, there was a very sudden and immediate need to provide a lot of liquidity to the financial system, uh, make sure that uh, you know money kept coming out of the ATMs. That that ordinary business didn't get disrupted uh, for, for just for reasons of not being able to make payments. And I would give uh, central banks and uh, uh, treasuries around the world a lot of credit for having moved very quickly on this front. And it did help, as I mentioned, that they had a little bit of a, not a practice run because it was quite a different situation in 2008, 2009, a financial crisis propagating out into the real economy. This time it's a real, it's a real economy crisis. Uh, but they rolled that stuff out very quickly. They did it in large amounts. And I think that's all to the good. Another thing that I uh, liked, it took a little bit longer to do, but uh, once the idea caught on, you saw governments all over the place doing it, was uh, letting people defer payments of taxes. Again, in the very short run, one of the things you have to worry about is that people just aren't going to have the cash. And if there are failures of people to make payments, even when otherwise uh, they would be willing and able to carry on business as usual, uh, that comment that you made earlier about the, the crisis propagating and getting exponentially worse, uh, that happens very quickly. So you saw, for example, the federal government uh, announced immediate grace periods when it comes to personal income taxes, uh, GST remittances. We've seen things at the provincial level letting people, uh, provinces that control property taxes, uh, cities have done the same thing. I think all that sort of thing is really good. It makes a lot of sense. It ensures that you're not going to have that short-term liquidity crunch. And for people who are worried about the longer-term fiscal costs, what's nice about letting people defer taxes is you're not forgiving them. Right. Over time, some of them will prove to be uncollectible because the economy is in terrible shape and there will be people who won't be able to make the payments that uh, got deferred. But on the whole, that's a deferral. It's not It's not something that's going to permanently go on the bottom line and, and raise public uh, debts. So that's... Uh, I, I was very happy to see that happen. Uh, now, and I, I won't even try to go down uh, the list here, we've got the bigger fiscal measures that are happening. The, they are uh, spending programs that are going to be uh, quite open-ended in many cases. They are going to go on the bottom line. Uh, we're going to be working the cost of this stuff off uh, for a long time. And there's also going to be a lot of pressure to maintain it, like the wage subsidy program, these extra income supports that the federal government has put in. Uh, so uh, there's 
there's a lot there. Uh, I think a lot of it's very well motivated, and the wage subsidy program particularly was one that uh, uh, I favored. I thought that was a great idea. Uh, but um, there's going to be a lot of heavy lifting to do as we work our way through this and try and figure out how to taper that stuff off and get ourselves back to where we will need to be over the long run. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember being in government uh, during the financial crisis. I was the minister of industry, and uh, we did a lot of spending uh, very quickly. But we had we had a two what I called a two year cliff, a lot of spending. It, it was only on the books for two fiscal years maximum, and then it was automatically off the books. Government didn't have to do anything; it was just automatically off the book, and uh, that. Uh, gave us the the chance to be back to a balanced budget. Otherwise, the, you just keep spending on infrastructure. You just keep spending on, on whatever. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult for governments, as you know, to take away what they have been, what they have given. So uh, I think that kind of discipline is going to be needed here as well. Well, one of, I, there were many things that I liked about the wage subsidy. Uh, I, I referred earlier uh, to the, the trauma uh, of layoff uh, and um, Thinking of it from an economic point of view, if if the employer and the employee relationship breaks down, then many of the things we want to be able to do as we get more back to normal, restarting uh, parts of the economy get get harder to do. Uh, very expensive, and and maybe even the expense of it is a virtue in the sense that it can't go on very long. There is no way the federal government can be spending four or five, six billion dollars a week. Uh, to subsidize wages. And so that kind of forces attention to what your exit strategy is. Uh, so in that particular case, I think that it's clear that it, it just can't go on forever. Some of the income supports, though, that are out there, uh, there will be enormous pressure to maintain them. And then you've got other areas that need a little bit of attention as well. Uh, the It's very attractive at the beginning, for example, of a crisis like this to say uh, nobody can evict a tenant who's behind on the rent. Uh, that's popular and it's clearly a very compassionate looking thing to do. Uh, but once you've done that, uh, there are a lot of other things that you need to do in order to make sure, first of all, that the landlords who suddenly don't have any income, and we've heard from some not-for-profit housing uh, organizations uh, whose, whose uh, tenants are typically not in great shape to begin with, uh, that they're now really worried about whether they're going to be able to just to, to keep operating at all. You have to be thinking about your exit strategy there too, because uh, a tenant who is suddenly uh, at no danger of being evicted, uh, who might even have the option to pay rent and decides not to pay rent, uh, it's not going to be that straightforward in July to say, okay, now you're going to start paying rent again. Uh, you might find there's a lot of resistance. So tough type of situation, but you have to be thinking about those things. And we will be thinking about those things in the uh, weeks and months ahead. Uh, Mr. Bill Robson, uh, CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute, thank you for being a guest on Boom and Bust at the News Forum. And uh, we'll be following this situation very closely. Thanks well, again. Well, thank you. A uh, bit pleasure to be here. Even if it was on the bus side, maybe we can get together again when we're more able to talk about Boom. Absolutely. That's a, that's a good, uh, positive thought.